Um, did, you, did you ever hear about the uh, rainbow that faded? Went to prism. <laughs> it's all right, it's a light sentence. That's pretty good, isn't it? All right. Thank you. Come on, bring it in here, will you? So we're so glad to see you, the best people on the planet, the Bay Point Churchers, and uh, we love you and so glad you're here. And uh, we're going to uh, just lift up a couple prayer requests that we have today, and, um, and will you bow your heads and hearts with me? Good and gracious God, you are awesome, you are great, you're amazing. And Lord God, your plan is so fantastic, it's even more than we could ever hope, imagine, or think of. And Lord God, we know sometimes we get so drowned in, in, in the task and the daily living and the domestic, domestic affairs that are before us. But Lord God, we want to reach another level today, another level of experiencing you uh, through, through your music, your message, and your people. And God, we, we, we know we're doing that right now. Your spirit's already here. And we've opened up our hearts. We've opened up our emotions and so, God, we, we pray that you would do that which only you can do, and that is to change hearts, that you would do only what you can do, and that's to transform souls. Lord, that you would do only what you can do, and that is to come and bless your people. Keep your mighty hand a blessing and a joy upon them. We thank you for your promise that you delight, you dance over your people. You are such a kind and loving God that, that Lord God, our circumstances might change, but you do not. And even though we can't, as the Apostle Paul said, we see through the glass darkly. We, we have trouble seeing sometimes past the present moment that we are experiencing, past the present circumstances that we are experiencing, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. But Lord God, you got a plan. And you, we have a hope in you that far exceeds anything of this particular moment, anything of this particular circumstance. And so, God, we just live for the praise of your glory, the grace that you have bestowed to us. We just revel in it. We just see it. We just feel it. We believe it. We're touched by it this morning. And so, Lord God, we want to uh, just pray for those who have sicknesses and illnesses and infirmities. And, and Lord God, those who are still experiencing many things through the seasonal uh, viruses that inhabit Florida. Lord, we lift up those who are facing surgery or are recovering from surgery. We lift up those who are uh, experiencing some relational challenges or financial challenges as well. God, we, we lift it all before you. And, and we know that you are involved in each and every aspect. And even though we can't make the connection sometime, we know that you will ultimately. We know that in all things, all things, you are working the good for those who love you and are called according to your purposes. And that is us this morning. We love you and we're called according to your purposes. Now, will you please bless us as we spend the time in your word. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Have you ever had an experience where you just lay awake at night, middle of the night, and you're tossing and turning, and you're thrashing about, sometimes in a cold sweat, as you ponder particular problems, maybe in your life or even in the world? This phenomenon sometimes is called the dark night of the soul, and it's accompanied by restlessness and, and sleeplessness and a, a dash of insomnia where your brain just won't shut off. It keeps churning and churning and churning over, over something that may have happened to you or somebody else. And, and try as you might, you, you just can't stop. And you lay there, you know, topsy-turvy. You just can't sleep as much as you want to. Now, when this happens to me, and, and I have to admit it happens quite frequently, it usually happens over some kind of injustice or unfairness that has happened in the world, some brutality that some folks have done to other folks and, and, and those things. And, you know, I, I kind of get it, and I think you do too. Um, people's inhumanity to people is quite often and prevalent in our world because you know what we are sinful we are selfish and we are spoiled and we have absolutely no compunction 
of running over people if they, if they stand in our way of something we believe we need or, or something we feel that we want. We, we get that, don't we? we? We understand that. But what happens when the unsolvable problem that keeps you awake late into the wee hours of the morning has something to do with God? You ever ponder the metaphysics? <laughs> Do you ever lay there at night and think, where in the world or what is God doing? Because it doesn't make sense to our logic, right? And, and, and how we put things together. That maybe somehow God has a character issue. That, that God isn't as perfect as we have been taught. That he's not as glorious as we have been led to believe that somehow God is playing favorites or that God is being unfair. You ever, ever ruminate that in your spirit? Well, this is exactly what happened to the Apostle Paul. He stayed up in the wee hours of the morning pondering a problem with God. Something he just couldn't connect. Something that just didn't make sense. If God is God, why did this thing happen? Something in history has happened that made it seem like God is not all that he's cracked up to be or he's not who he said he is. So as we continue our countdown to the cross today, I want you to come with me to Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, so that we might identify that problem and try to solve it. In Romans 3, 21 through 26, um, Romans is probably the most important book of the letters of Paul. And if you want to figure out problems like, you know, with God or what God is doing, this is the book to go to to figure it all out. But he says in Romans 3, 21 through 26, now a righteousness or right action of God, a righteousness from God apart from the law, that's the Mosaic law in the Old Testament, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody say, oh me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance, he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. Everybody say that word with me, unpunished. He did, the, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. What has happened in history that has given the impression that God is not right, that God has a character flaw, that God has done something that makes it look like he's not perfect? Now, you might be surprised by this answer according to this text. I talked to a few people about this text this week, and nobody got the answer and they said, well, well, how is that a problem? Because the problem is that God is just too nice. He's too kind. He's too merciful. Have you ever laid awake at night grappling with the problem that God is too nice? Put your hand up if you have. Now, if you don't think that's too big of a deal, let me just tell you, that not only Paul, but also many of the saints in the Old Testament 
struggled with this problem. God, you were so nice. You were so kind. You were so loving. You were so merciful. The, the heathens, the pagans, those who reject you, you just shower them with blessings and you cause them to prosper. That's a problem, God, isn't it? Now, if you don't think it's such a, a, a big problem, or you don't think the kindness of God is worth questioning, let, let me, let's walk through a hypothetical. Imagine that you are on vacation, and while you're away, a thief breaks into your house, and he starts rummaging around, taking all your valuables, helping himself to whatever he wants. Little does he know that you're watching the whole thing on your home security app. You call the cops. They arrive at your house. They catch this thief red-handed, and they throw him in the slammer. The next day, while you're at the trial, the prosecutor does a great job. The video evidence is indisputable. It's conclusive. He even gets your thief to confess that, yes, he did the crime, and now he's ready to do the time. You sit back and you say, whoa, justice served. Amen, justice served. Cut and dried. Isn't this awesome? The judicial system actually works for once. And you're sitting there, glad. He's not going to rip off any more people. We got him. He's getting thrown in a jail. But then a few moments later, something happens that just boggles your mind. The judge is about to announce the sentence. He said, the man we have before you is guilty on all charges that have been laid upon him beyond a reasonable doubt. We even have a confession. There is no doubt, there is no dispute. But let me tell you something. Today I'm feeling a little bit merciful. You know what, Joe Criminal? You're off the hook. See you next time. You're sitting there infuriated. What just happened? How could this be? How could there be such a perversion of justice? Just to throw in, could you imagine if Adolf Hitler would have survived, or would not have killed himself, and would have, would have faced the Nuremberg trials? And he's easily convicted against, for genocide and for war crimes and man's inhumanity to man like nobody else in history. Now, everybody in the room here thinks that, well, Adolf Hitler needs to pay for his crimes, right? Put your hand up if you think he should, okay? But then the Nuremberg judges say, Adolf, you just, you know what, don't worry about it. Just don't do it again. Something happens deep in our bones when we see injustices that are not actually brought to justice. We kind of see it every day, don't we, um, in this world. And you sit there, you're infuriated. And this time it's personal, very personal. So a well, a well documented case in the Old Testament about the problem of God being too kind, being too nice, being too merciful is in the story of David and Bathsheba. Who remembers that one? That's kind of the one that everybody knows, right? And you remember, David was the second king of Israel. He was God's anointed. He succeeded Saul, the first king. And David took a fledgling little nation and brought it up to be a world superpower. But he was not only a warrior king, he was also a spiritual giant. He was called a man after God's own heart. How many dudes here this morning want that to be said about you? I do. That would be awesome reputation to have. But in his later years, he became a man after something else. And that something else was a young hottie named Bathsheba. Back then, I know it's hard to picture, but the baths were in the courtyards and they were kind of open to public. And one day, David 
when he should have been off to war with his troops and sitting there looking over his big balcony of his kingdom and he eyes a bathing Bathsheba. Immediately lust and entitlement takes over his heart and he summons her to his chambers for a torrid one night stand. Later, it's found out that she became pregnant from this. Oh my goodness, a national scandal ensues. David, a man after God's own heart, has committed gross immorality. And so he does what most politicians do. What do they do, folks? They cover up, right? They cover up. He immediately has Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, a soldier in his army, sent to the front lines, exposed with absolutely no support, and he is killed. And then he does his act of kindness. Look at this grieving widow Bathsheba. I will bring her into my chambers. Scandal averted once and for all. Have you guys ever heard of the pesky prophets? (laughs) How many like having a prophet in your life? I don't mean some people who forecast something about the future, but that person of accountability that's in your life that helps you when you seem to be going off the deep end. Everybody in this room needs that person, believe you me. And so the pesky prophet named Nathan um, shows up at the palace doors unannounced. He says, look, David, God has told me what you've done. We know what you did, and you best now repent of your sins. David is filled with remorse. He's he's filled with conviction, and he repents. Oh, my goodness, like a Billy Graham crusade. He repents of this horrible sins that he has committed. Okay, what happens then? Because of his repentance, listen to what Nathan, the prophet, said to him. Nevertheless, God says you will live. Are you guys feeling the injustice right now? Nevertheless, God says you will live. He has put away your sin, and you will not die. Who said, what the who now? Is there a two-tiered system of justice going on here? You know, the, the people in power get their own special, you know, judicial system, and people under that don't. This was by far the godliest king of Israel, by far. And yet he breaks two cardinal commandments. And a capital crime on top of that. He brings shame on his entire nation. He has the husband of the woman that he had the affair with, has him put to death. No big deal. No big deal. Do you all remember what the penalty was under Mosaic law for adultery? And for murder, you know what it was? Stoning. Get caught in the act? No questions. Stoning. But nobody's throwing rocks that day because God is too kind. God is too nice. God's too forgiving. And that's a problem. Most likely, that is the story that the Apostle Paul had in mind when he wrote this. Because of his divine patience, God passed over sins previously committed. God passed over sins. Wait, I I I thought God was just... I I thought God was holy. Yes, he's loving and all that, but he's also just and holy. And And if there's nobody in the universe who's holding the line, the bar on justice, then there is no justice 
anywhere at any time. If God doesn't do it, if God can't do it, it's not going to happen. You might think, well, well, that's okay. Let's get away with what we can get away with then. Okay. Then don't cry when bad things happen to you. Don't be a big baby. If you don't think there should be justice in the universe anywhere, right now or at the end of history, when something bad happens to you and somebody gets away with hurting you or offending you, oh, just don't worry about it because you know what? I don't like a God who's just. I don't like a God who's holy. I don't, I don't like a God who has moral laws and stuff. like. Okay, okay, fair. Don't complain. Don't be a big baby then when bad things happen to you. You see, for centuries, Psalm 110, verse... I'm sorry, Psalm 103 verse 10 says that God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. How many are glad about that? Put your hand up. And how many know it's totally a moral outrage? It's totally unjust. Not to punish a criminal for a crime, not to sentence a sinner for sins, well, this, this, this has thrown the whole game out of whack. Out of whack. It's a problem. In verse 23, Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, every sin we commit, omission, commission, through action, through inaction, whatever, whatever, however you want to categorize it. Every sin that we commit despises and it scorns and it belittles the goodness and the glory of God in his intention to us. Notice what it says, all of us have sinned. It's a universal indictment. All have sinned, some more than others, some worse than others, but all have sinned. And we know we sin because we're sinners and we're sinners because we sin. And we know what we deserve. But imagine, if you will, that, that, that God would indeed zap us. <laughs> you know those little bug zappers you have off your patio? What if every time we sinned, we were zapped just like that? Snuffed out of existence. How many would be here this morning? <laughs> Anybody left-handed this morning? Put your hand up if you're a lefty, quick. All right, only the lefties would be here. <laughs> because as you know, everybody's born left-handed, and you only turn righty when you commit your first sin. <laughs> Who would be left? Would you be left? Would you be here right now? <laughs> I definitely wouldn't. I don't think I'd make it off the first day on this planet. But here's the thing about God. He's not only just, but he's patient. He's patient. However, sin still needs to be dealt with justly. It can't be swept under a cosmic rug somewhere. I'll just forget about it. Because people are hurt because of sin. I don't know if you've been on this planet for more than two days. But people are hurt because of sin. God's glory is besmirched because of sin. Now, God could go all grandpappy. I'm enjoying my first two years of being a grandfather. It doesn't matter what little Leo and what little Will do. I just say, oh, you're good. You're fine. It's funny the way you screw up. <laughs> it is kind of cute. But we're free moral agents. We're not little kids. God is patient. So he must deal with it. He must deal with this collision of being too kind, too merciful, too forgiving, too loving, and having to deal with our falling short of his glory. That's what the cross beam is all about. 
the intersection between God's love for us and God dealing with our sin. God dealt with this problem when he put his son on the cross. All of the sins that he previously passed over were stored up, brought over into what they call the middle part of history and slammed against the cross. Every sin of everyone that anyone has committed were nailed to that cross the day Jesus Christ was nailed to that cross. So the problem that God solved in the death of Jesus Christ enabled him to forgive our sins and yet still be holy, still be just, and still be loving at the same time. That's how amazing our God is. And I'm sure when the Apostle Paul, as he laid awake at night, turning and churning and all that, I'm sure when he realized that, he went to sleep immediately and slept like an inborn, a newborn infant. But here's the great news. It's even better news than that. For a bonus, Paul tells us that God put Jesus on the cross not only because he is just, but he is also a justifier of those who put their faith in Jesus. Do you know what that means? <laughs> that God's not only going to forgive us of sins previously committed, but he is going to now see us and treat us as if we have never, ever committed one sin in our lives. Anybody here ever commit sin? You like it? Of course you don't. If you're a child of God, you hate sin. You hate falling short of God's glory. You hate hurting others. But when God put forth Jesus to demonstrate, to prove without a shadow of a doubt that he is righteous, just, and forgiving. We are justified. When we place our faith, our total trust in what Jesus has done for us on the cross. That's why we're no longer called sinners. We're called saints. Saints. Because God does not view us according to our sin anymore or our falling short. He sees us as being saved and as being redeemed and being restored and being reconciled. Because the death of his son. Now, I don't know about you, but that's worth getting up in the morning and having a great day no matter what. Now, if you haven't yet trusted Jesus fully, for his work on the cross. I'm going to read from you an old lyric from the late great Christian singer, Keith Green, who sang about this so passionately in a song called The Oracle. Now, I don't want you to run out, so I'm not going to sing it. But I do want you to pay close attention to these words. And most people don't find out till it's too late, that someone has to pay a price. You can pay it yourself or let someone else, but who would be that nice to pay a debt that isn't his? Well, I know someone like that. He's your best friend. He really is. He really loves you. Most people don't find out till they're half dead that they need another life. You say you've heard everything that's ever been said about the way, the truth, and the life. You say you've heard lots of preaching all before so many times. How many sermons have we heard on this subject? 100 million, right? 
but did you ever open up your door and let him in? Give him a chance to prove himself that he's real or not. I hope you find out before it's too late that there's really nobody else. You know, it's breaking his heart the longer you wait because you've only been lying to yourself because no one believes a thing you say, not even you. You know, you're going to find out that he's the way. No matter which way you choose. But I pray you find out by his love for you. Amen. Will you bow your heads and hearts with me? Heavenly Lord, we, we just want to lift up you today. <laughs> words in the English language or in any language on this planet cannot do justice to your mercy, your grace, your love, your justice, your holiness, all rolled into one, all rolled into the cross of Jesus Christ. So I pray, as we always pray, for Christ followers first, that they would just absolutely ponder every day the magnificence of the cross, our very foundation for everything that we are, for everything that we have, for everything that will happen to us in the future is because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And for those who are leery, those who are doubting, those who are questioning, I just pray that you would move on their hearts today. That may, perhaps for the very first time in their life, they would make this faith move. Just like all of us had to do. And just say, you know what, all the, all the questions may not be answered, but it doesn't matter. Jesus Christ hung on a cross for me. And that is enough for me to surrender my entire life to him. Move heavily, God, upon us today for the glory of your Son and the joy of your people. Amen and amen.